I'm saying like these brothers, they want they would get you in a way where they couldn't even use DNA. Like I, I, just, I hear you because I hear like they using like this a case where one of the bro early brothers were they using with DNA. They said they used DNA and then they went back and observed the hair that they was using the DNA. Said it was connected to him and it was dog hair. Hmm. I was in the DA's office in the 80s and the 90s. That was like the standard operating procedure. A police officer would keep. I mean, I hate to say this, but it was, it was it's, you know, you could read about it in books. They would keep a second gun that nobody knew about on their ankle. And so if they ever killed someone who they shouldn't have, they would then take that gun out right. and put the You're talking about out. dirty cops. I'm though. talking about dirty cops in, right. in, in the 70s right. and 80s and corruption. And there was all kinds of, you know, right. trials having to do with that. That was before the iPhone. I mean, because it's just speaking to what is going on right now. Like, it's one thing to talk about what's going on in 1996 and 98. It's still going on. Where you got this whole system that has been established to where you think it's, it's the legal. They call it legal. They're, they're enforcing the laws that exist. But here it is, like they, all they are is licensed criminals. Where they, what they doing, like with the, the, this crash unit, what they did, where they, they had tattoos and they had gang signs and all this stuff or whatever. They would run up on an innocent brother, throw a gun on him, throw dope on him. Put them in there or pressure them to get information, all this stuff. And, and so th this is what they were doing. And they, they said that they was using it as a means to get the, the quotas and the collars and stuff that they wanted. You know what I'm saying? They say that they needed to do it to deal with the gang problem, but they weren't locking primarily gang members up. They was locking everyday brothers up. Like when you see the, the, the character that Denzel played in Training Day, yeah. that's them. Go back and watch that movie. That's them. I think clearly that some people in the department uh, operated under the idea that uh, they could break the law to enforce it somehow. That these people were less than uh, full citizens. Fighting a war against an unpopular foe, some officers crossed the line and took on the ways and rituals of their enemy. The gangbangers on the street called on another gang, a gang in blue, a gang that doesn't have to play by the same rules that we do. And uh, certainly that mentality uh, became a part of what Rampart Crash was about. Rampart Crash had a swaggering slogan. We intimidate those who intimidate others. But according to testimony from the disgraced Officer Perez, they also had a lot more than that. Some of the cops wore a macho tattoo, a grinning skull with a cowboy hat. They had secret hand signals and secret ceremonies during which they awarded plaques to cops who shot gang members. One level if they just wounded the guy, a really special prize if they killed him. In other words, they had all the trappings of a gang. It's kind of scary to believe that this is happening. Okay, the, he also implicated, <laughs> these, these, this crash unit is also implicated in the death of Biggie. Now you gotta understand something about that is, is that if Tupac's murder was political, and you have an agency that's associated to the United States government that creates the atmosphere for a person that's not political to be killed, how do you think they set up the murder of Tupac? How do you think they're setting up the murder and the incarceration of other brothers that's political? So I'm mean, all of this stuff is connected. Well, they got a, I, let me go this in. They got a movie out that uh, the guy that was head of Tupac security. Yes, sir. Did, have you seen that? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. I'm I'm trying. His name is escaping me right now. Yeah, but I mean, but a lot of this stuff is documented, and, and that's what I'm saying. Like they've already did the dirt. This is already two decades down the line. Now they can admit it. Cause what you gonna do? Uh -huh. We didn't already been successful with Rest 84. What are you going to do? It's almost like admitting that we killed Dr. King. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Man, they gonna get King money. The King film some money so they won't write a book and make a movie, and we're gonna keep going. Check this out. It's it's almost like yeah, we did bring dopes in large ton amounts into the black neighborhood. And guess what? You know who wrote Rex 84? The same dude, Oliver North. Yeah. It's, I mean, and the other guy was Louis Cafreda, who's in charge of FEMA. So that's what I'm saying. Like, this is like, it's not like happenstance. There's no wiggle room with this. But the, the people that know it, it's like, what you gonna do?
Hmm. We didn't already set up the infrastructure to where as soon as you want to say like, look, this is what you did. They're like, keep on running. Close the door right behind you. For more than a quarter century, Black Panther Party member Geronimo Pratt said he was the victim of an FBI setup. He was convicted of a murder he insists he did not commit. A year ago, CBS News turned up evidence the key prosecution witness was a police informer, something the jury was never told. This doesn't necessarily mean that Pratt is innocent. It may mean that he did not get a fair trial. Today, Geronimo Pratt walked free on bail and talked to CBS News correspondent Jerry Bowen. After 25 years and five appeals, a victory for ex-Black Panther Geronimo Pratt today, victory and freedom. We're going to keep on until we get the, you know, the same.